Hi everyone. So we're here today on Blogging Heads TV to talk about animals and our sometimes strange relationship with animals. I'm Emily Anthes. I'm a freelance science journalist and author of the book Frankenstein's Cat, Cuddling Up to Biotech's Brave New Beasts. And I'm here today with a great conversational partner. Well, we'll see about that. I hope so. I'm Hal Herzog. I'm a professor of psychology <laughs> at Western Carolina University, and I study human-animal interactions, and I'm the author of the book, Some We Love, Some We Hate, Some We Eat, Why It's So Hard to Think Straight About Animals. That's right. And I actually came to know Hal because I discovered his book in the course of researching my own book. And it really resonated with me because it directly addressed something I thought a lot about, which was why are our relationships with animals sometimes so strange? Why are our attitudes so inconsistent? So I'm curious how, what prompted you to write this book and why you wanted to tackle this issue of the inconsistency of our views towards animals. Well, I I wrote it somewhat reluctantly in a way. I've written a lot of, I've been, I've been studying human-animal interactions for over 20 years, but I never thought of myself as being a, a, a book writer. Um, but I found that I enjoyed trying to communicate with the public, um, and I wanted to reach out to a broader audience. And the central theme of my book is really moral inconsistency. And I, I look at human-animal interactions as a way to look at, you know, sort of big issues in human nature. And so I, I, for the last really 20 years now, I've been studying people that have morally complicated relations with animals, ranging all the way from uh, rooster fighters and their moral worlds, how they construct a moral world that makes it okay to, to, to fight chickens, to animal activists, to uh, veterinary school students, to uh, scientists who work with animals. And so I decided it was time to sort of try and put it all together and try and make some sense out of this, this, this complicated world that we have, that we share with other species. Well, can you give us an example of an inconsistent belief or what seems like it might be an inconsistent belief that you ran across? Well, well, sure. One of the, one of the, 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 the fundamental inconsistency, I think, for a lot of us, is that on the one hand, we love animals, but on the other hand, 95 plus percent of us love to eat animals. And um, so we're all sort of a little bit inconsistent, but some people are sort of more inconsistent than others. And for example, one of the things that I found out was that I've, uh, I've studied vegetarians. And a number of study have, studies have shown that uh, about 65 percent of people that say that they're vegetarians um, have eaten animal flesh in the previous 24 hours. Um, so uh -huh. a good example of this is, is uh, President Clinton. President Clinton is, uh, is now a vegan. But in several recent interviews, right. he said, oh, by the way, I try and eat salmon every, every Friday. And so the question is, is Bill Clinton a hypocrite? Mm -hmm. Or is he simply reflecting something about the human condition? And I sort of concluded that we're, we're all sort of Bill Clinton's in our own way. At least most of us are. Yeah, I have to say, I found your book very reassuring because you sort of say it's okay to have these inconsistencies, or at least it's human nature. You're not alone. You're not the only one wondering if your own behaviors are hypocritical. No, I think, I think it's, I think it's pretty common. And the, uh, What's interesting is people that uh, are not inconsistent, that really go out of their way to be consistent. And for some of them, this leads to great happiness. For others, however, it drives them a little crazy. And so it's a, it's, it can be a tough, a tough line. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you something. I uh, read your book, Frankenstein's Cat, and absolutely loved it. And we deal with some of the same, same issues. Yeah. How, did, how did you come to write that book? What, what drew you to that? It's interesting because it's sort of exactly what we've been talking about. In some ways, it was me trying to make sense of my own beliefs. Uh, I'm a science writer, so obviously I love science. I believe in science. I believe in the scientific process. But I'm also an animal lover, and I was seeing all of these genetic engineering projects that were happening and so often it seems like they were being portrayed as it was science versus animals. 
So we could either have these great advances, these new medicines, these organ transplants from animals, or we could have animal welfare, but we couldn't have both. And so I was interested in exploring that notion and seeing if there wasn't a place where science and animal welfare, or at least genetic engineering and animal welfare, could come together and overlap. And also to make sense of the fact that I was excited about these advances, but at the same time, some of them made me uncomfortable. So it was a way to explore that inconsistency and my own sort of mixed feelings about all of these developments. Well, let me ask you, how did you, how did you come up with the title to your book? Well, I have to say that wasn't actually me. Uh, that was, we toyed around with a bunch of different ideas. And now, of course, I can't remember any of the, the losing ideas. Oh, you know, I think the first idea was super beasts because I liked the idea of all of these animals that were getting new powers. But it was actually the, the British agent we had, a UK literary agent, suggested Frankenstein's cat. And I think we liked it because it deliberately co-opted and used the language that's often used about these animals, the Franken goats or Franken cats. And we liked the idea of engaging with that directly. There's a, I, I, after partially inspired by your book, I went back and read Frankenstein, the original Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley version of right. Frankenstein. And I came away with that uh, thinking that the real theme, the underlying theme in Frankenstein is the idea of, uh, human hubris, the idea of what happens when humans humans play God. And in some ways, the monster in Frankenstein uh, was a, a victim. In some way, he's evil. In some way, he's a victim of, of this human manipulation. And, and in thinking about your book, I, I wondered if that was one of the, the, the main themes in your book, of that are we playing God? And that's usually used as sort of a derogatory uh, idea, but but I wondered if you thought about that very much, and 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 what exactly is wrong with playing God? Humans humans been playing God with animals for a very long time. What's wrong with that? Yeah, I, I engaged with those ideas directly in a couple of ways. I mean, I think the first, I'll take the second question first, I guess, which is that no, we ha we have all these new powers and. In my mind, at least, there's nothing inherently wrong with mm -hmm. playing God. We can do all these new things. What we should be judging these advances by is, is how we're using them. So we have all sorts of new power to do harm, absolutely, and to hurt animals and endanger the environment. But we also have all sorts of new powers to do good. So there's not – the technology itself isn't inherently good or evil. It all comes down to how we use it. And as you point out – it's not like we're suddenly influencing the natural world for the first time. I mean, our very, well, first of all, there are things like domestication and how we've created dog breeds, but also at this point, our very presence on the planet influences all sorts of other species. So for me, the question was going forward, it's not a matter of, are we going to influence other life forms or not, but how are we going to influence them and how can we coexist with them and, and be good stewards, stewards, sorry, of the other organisms on the planet. Well, you had, a, you had a really interesting example of that in your book, I thought, when you talk with, with, with Robo Roach. And um, maybe you could talk just a little bit about what Robo Roach is and your own experience with taking control of an animal and having it do what you wanted it to do. Sure. So I talk about cybernetics and how advances in electronics and neuroscience have given us the new ability to essentially hijack another creature's mm -hmm. nervous system. We can thread wires into a beetle's brain or a roach's antenna and issue nerve impulses directly into the brain or the nervous system. And as a result, we can control these animals' movements. So a lot of this work is happening in university laboratories. Um, there's a scientist at UC Berkeley who's creating robo beetles and for a variety of purposes. But there's also a company now that has made these technologies available to the public, and it's called Backyard Brain. <laughs> you can go online and... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
So you can go online and for $99, order a Robo Roach kit, which comes with all you need to turn a live cockroach into what's essentially a remote controlled toy or a car. And I had the chance to commandeer one of these, if you will. Uh, We put the roach down on the sidewalk in a public place in in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And I had a little remote control. And I started pressing commands. It's it's not very fine-tuned, but you can press the right or the left button. And the roach will sort of spin around and, and head in that general direction. And, of course, a crowd formed. Uh, everyone was really interested in uh, this technology. In fact, one woman walked by and said, oh, it looks so real. And, of course, you know, it is real. It, she thought it was a, a robot, an entirely robotic cockroach at first. Um, but... Yeah, it was simultaneously very interesting. I found it fascinating that you could build something like this with what are essentially off-the-shelf parts, but also a little bit creepy. And I'm not a huge fan of roaches, but (laughs) it's hard not to to feel a little bit sorry for the roach in that scenario. So it's it's a hard balance, and I, I frequently found myself with these simultaneously coexisting, conflicting feelings. Yeah. My, my sense that a lot of our interactions with the animals are boiled down to conflicting feelings. I, I, I have one of my main conflicts is uh, living with a serial killer of a cat. And um, yeah, uh, the one hand, yes. I, you know, I love my cat and she's a sweetheart to me, but she likes to go outside and I let her go outside. I feel like it would be not fair to her, you know, to make her stay in the giant cage that's my house. And then she goes out there and she kills little animals. And uh, so I've, you know, I've sort of made my peace with, with eating animals, but I, st- I still feel queasy. I feel morally responsible for the murderous habits of my lovely little cat, Tilly. Yeah, there, there have been a bunch of blowups in the media lately. It sort of gets portrayed as the cat people versus the bird people. And people feel very loyal to whichever side of that argument they're on or whichever animal they sort of think is more beautiful or that they cuter or they identify yeah. with. And there have been some pretty ugly exchanges of words between cat owners and, and bird watchers. Yeah, there's actually been, there was one, uh, there, there's actually been gunfire involved in some of those, in some of those interactions. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And I, I think, don't you talk, you're a bit of a reptile guy, right? So don't you talk in your book about sort of feeding mice to snakes and the conflict that involves? Well, the original title of my book uh, was uh, Feeding Kittens to Boa Constrictors. And, and, oh, and the, oh, right. uh, my agent and my editor both said, that no, nobody would buy a book with that title. So I wound up changing it. But uh, yeah, I'm a bit of a reptile guy. And I was a reptile guy mm-hmm. when I was a kid. I was always fascinated by snakes. And then when I get to grad school in psychology, it turned out that I was at University of Tennessee and there was one of the, the world's great reptile researchers there, Gordon Burkhart. And I sort of hooked up with him. And so my 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 uh, early research and my early part of my career was really on animal behavior. I was the, uh, uh, at one point, I was one of the world's experts on alligator vocalizations. And then I shifted to snakes and I became the guy who invented the first and uh, only snake personality test. But I also had, uh, but I, <laughs> sorry, can, can I interrupt you to ask what's on the snake well, personality test? Well, the test was test? fairly simple. Um, and it was, we looked at individual differences in how, uh, nasty and nice snakes were, um, by having, by seeing how many, these were baby snakes and garter snakes, they weren't poisonous, but I developed a test and a systematic test to see how many times they would try and bite my finger in a, in a two, in, in, in a two minute trial. So I've been bitten, but I was going to call the Guinness book of records about this, but I haven't, but I've been bitten by snakes and I have this recorded thousands and thousands of times. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a very hard test for you. Yeah, no one that it was it, it was you know it worked. You know, we got a lot of papers out and we found some stuff out and but at some point I switched over to human uh, human animal interactions. But we did the reason why my book was called Feeding Kids to Bow Constrictors is uh uh my son had a pet boa constrictor and uh named Sam, who was a baby boa. But I got a call one day from a friend of mine that's an animal activist. And she said that there was a rumor floating around saying that my son was uh, feeding kittens to to boa constrictors, to to his pet boa constrictor. And uh, I sort of laughed at that, 
the idea that I was going to the humane, you know, the humane society shelter and picking up kittens was absolutely ridiculous. Plus, Sam was way too, way too small to, um, to, uh, to, to eat, to eat, a, to eat a kitten. Um, so, uh, you know, I told her to, you know, call off the dogs, you know, tell her pals it wasn't true, but, but, you know, which she did, but I, it, it haunted me. I kept thinking about it and I, and I began to think, well, you know, there's a, there's a lot of kittens that are euthanized in the United States each year. Um, why should I be buying mice that are raised to be fed by boa constrictors? I mean, read to, you know, you know, raised to be fed to snakes when there's, when there's all these, you know, kittens around that are going to be killed anyway right. in animal shelters. Well, maybe I should be feeding kittens to boa constrictors. And then, and then this, the, the yuck factor, as you talk about in your book, Leon Kasmintians, the yuck factor kicked in and it was like, no, there's no way I would ever feed a kitten to boa right. constrictors. And I began to think about the sort of, you know, moral hypocrisy of being a cat owner, you know, when, uh, when we, we basically feed the equivalent of 25 millions of million, uh, uh, chickens a year to our, to our cats, and at the same time, it's a predator just like a boa constrictor, and so that sort of got me thinking about these sort of moral inconsistencies in 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 my in my own life. Yeah, well, you just brought up the yuck factor, which you know is is something I talk about in the book. This sort of visceral disgust that we sometimes have at technology or, or some of these animal issues we're talking about. Um, but I believe you, you just did some research on something similar, right? So you were looking at not the yuck factor, but how people viewed different kinds of sort of altered animals. Is that right? Yeah. Well, what uh, we've been doing is looking at what people think is natural and unnatural in terms of animals. And this research was inspired by work by Paul Rosen at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's he's recognized that people like the idea that things are natural. We buy, you know, you know, 100 percent natural food products. We prefer things that are natural to unnatural. And he's looked at things like, well, what makes what makes things unnatural? So, for example, if you uh, put fluoride in water, is the water less natural? Or if you mm. get genetically modified corn, is you know, how much how unnatural is that compared to, you know, you know, in, you know, Mexican maize, you know, the, the original corn. And right. so we just did a study where we looked at uh, that idea in terms of in terms of other species. So, for example, how much how, how less natural is a dog than a wolf or how less natural is a uh, an animal, a, a dolphin living in SeaWorld compared to, say, a dolphin living in, a, in, a, in the ocean or how less natural is a uh, genetically uh, modified uh, cow or an art of cow produced by artificial insemination or a, a pet, something that you talk about in your book, a, a pet produced by cloning, a dog produced by cloning. Right. And so what, what we found, we developed a little survey where we asked people how natural things are. You know, how natural is a wolf? How natural is a dolphin living in SeaWorld? How natural is a cloned, is a cloned dog as opposed to a, to a, to a, to a, uh, a non-cloned dog, a regular right. dog? And what we found was pretty interesting. And what we found was that domestication, the dog versus wolf, uh, let's say, doesn't make much difference. Uh, it, it, it reduces naturalness by about 10%. Hmm. Captivity, on the other hand, if you ask people that you know how natural is an elephant in a zoo compared to an, Afri an, Af an elephant living in Africa, that results in about a fifty percent loss in what people think of its its, its naturalness. But the huh. biggest factor was the factor that you deal with in your book, biotechnology. Uh, when we talk about cloning, or you talk about uh, uh, any sort of genetic modification, the naturalness factor went down by seventy-five to eighty percent. Wow. So there's something about that genetic manipulation, something about scientists, scientists monkeying with the, the genes of animals that sort of make puts it in a different sort of category in terms of ethics and how we think about it. Did you ask people why they made the decisions they made? Did you get any insight into how they made those distinctions? No, we did not. This was a this was a pilot study, and okay. uh, I, I, I I honestly I wasn't expecting to find much, and what we found was absolutely <laughs> fascinating. So I think that's going to be our next step. 
our next step is going to be uh, to, to ask people, you know, to do to do a qualitative study and ask people, you know, what is it about cloning that makes it natural, you know, make, make something unnatural. Right. Do you think it's just familiarity? Like domestication to us now is, you know, so old and so familiar that it no longer seems novel or strange. I, I think that I think that's that's uh, definitely true. Um, there, there's something str- there's there, there's a there's even a strangeness about domestication though. So, for example, recently uh, I watched the Westminster Dog Show on television. Right. And Me too. When you look at when you look at pedigree dogs, the reason why I'm sort of fascinated by dog shows is is that what what humans have done, not through genetic engineering, but through selective breeding over the last 200 years to dogs has just been phenomenal. So you have you have a dog that's been bred to be, you know, full grown adult weighs two pounds, you know, a, a toy, uh, you know, toy Yorkshire Terrier. And you have dogs that their adult weight is 200 pounds. And that's the difference in size between me and an adult bull elephant in Africa. <laughs> So, so in some ways, there's something a little bit creepy about what we've done to, you know, our best friend, the dog. And this hasn't always been good for dogs, just like genetic engineering hasn't always been good for dogs. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things I wanted to do in my book is to try and put these new molecular genetics powers in context. So there are some important differences between them and selective breeding, but it's not as if we're suddenly changing animals forms for the first time and and certainly old-fashioned selective breeding as you point out can have plenty of welfare or negative welfare consequences as well so it's not limited to our new technologies absolutely Uh, we just uh, published a study in the journal plus one and we looked at um how people how people select uh, purebred, how people select purebred dogs. They do it mm-hmm. on the basis of having good behavior or good health and longevity and things like that. And what we found was that there was no relationship between a dog's behavior and how popular they are as pets. You know, these are, mm. these are breeds of dogs. And there was no relationship between a dog's, uh, or very little relationship between a dog's popularity and the number of genetic diseases it had. In fact, if anything, just the opposite, really popular dogs tend to have more genetic disorders than unpopular dogs. So right now, a dog that's got an enormous number of genetic problems, the, the uh, English bulldog, right. uh, is becoming a very, very popular dog. And these are animals that are, they've been called a, uh, you know, a veterinary rehab project. Do you think the uh, defects are in some, could they be a result of the popularity? So as these dogs get bred more to meet demand, they end up with more disorders? That, that that's a good question. We don't know the answer. We actually raised that possibility in the paper, mm-hmm. but we uh, we really we really don't don't know. Certainly, the uh, genetic problems that bulldogs have is the result of of selective breeding. Right. You know, right. Thir- th- thirty forty years ago, well, not not thirty forty years ago, back in the nineteen thirties and forties, bulldogs didn't have the same kind of problems that bulldogs have today. Yeah, there. Are, every once in a while, these pictures make the rounds online that are really compelling that show a whole bunch of breeds a hundred years ago and then today and show how much the forms have been exaggerated yeah. um, from what they used to be and presumably to meet dog show standards, um, you know, purely human projections of what we think these dogs should look like. Well, you got it exactly right in what dog show, I'm really fascinated by dog show, show judging. And I just, I just wrote a blog about this for my, for my psych today blog. Um, Basically, in a dog show, the uh, judges are not supposed to, to breed by comparing the dogs directly. They're supposed to, to compare it to this platonic ideal called the breed standard. Mm. So there's this, there's this sort, of, you know, sort of philosophical ideal beauty out there. And uh, they're trying to create, create something that looks, that, that, that looks like that. And uh, I compare it to uh, the modern tomato. What you've got is so you've got something that looks absolutely gorgeous. But, you know, you look under the hood. And things aren't necessarily right under there. The The UK Kennel Club has, or the Royal Kennel Club, I forget what it's called exactly, but they've made some progress in at least adding some criteria to judging, saying that the dogs should be healthy or, you know, 
they've tried to dial it back a little bit. As far as I know, the U.S. Kennel Club has been behind on that, and they haven't made similar changes to breed standards in that way. Well, one of the things that they've done, which is really fascinating, is they're now uh, registering mixed breed dogs. Yes. And this has just happened. And one one of the reasons that they're doing this is because AKC registrations are are crashing. They're down uh, 50% from what they were in the uh, in the in the 1990s. And so they're trying to expand, expand, expand the you know, number of potential registered dogs. But it's probably a good thing for, for dogs to, to, uh, to have some more genetic diversity in these, in, the, in these gene pools, for sure. Yeah, I saw in the agility competition for the Westminster, they were calling all the uh, mixed breed dogs all American dogs. So I guess that's a yeah, fancier yeah, word yeah. for mutt. Yeah, yeah. I like that. All American dogs. That's really exactly. Cool. I don't know what they would do similarly in, in the UK if they did that, but that's a separate question, I guess. So while we're talking about animal welfare here, uh, there's something I wanted to ask you. And so I, I talk a lot about genetic engineering and welfare in my book and ways that genetic engineering could potentially be used to boost animal welfare, or make their lives better. So things like engineering chickens that don't get bird flu and and things like that. And in the process, I sort of toyed with some thought experiments that had been put out there, one of which was, what if we could create cows or livestock that don't feel pain? And wouldn't this be, if we're going to have a beef industry, wouldn't this be a less cruel way to do it? And I thought that was pretty crazy. But then you came up with a thought experiment that was even crazier, (laughs) which was... What if we could engineer what you called S and M pigs, or pigs that actually actually enjoyed feeling pain? So I'm curious where on earth that idea came from. Okay, I th- I, I that idea came to me. I was at an animal law conference, and uh, we were talking about these issues, and we were talking about issues of animals, animals and agriculture, and it, it suddenly hit me. I think where it came from. Um, was that I, and, and, you know, people know me, you know, because of my work in human animal interactions. But the, the fact is that I, at, at my university, what I'm known for is the guy that teaches the human sexuality course. And so I had some students a couple of semesters ago who were uh, pretty highly involved in sadomasochistic culture. And we, and, and we actually uh, did, they actually did a panel on it. Uh, you know, they were there in class and, and they wanted to talk about, talk about that a bit, you know, sort of what, what the appeal was. And, um, and, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was pretty interesting. And there's something about for some people that, uh, there's that dopamine rush that comes with experiencing pain. And I remember being in this animal law conference and it suddenly hit me, well, you know, if you could, if you could, if, if our brain is wired, if some, not, not my brain, but, but, but if people's brains are wired to find uh, a certain amount of pleasure in, in pain, would it be possibly to genetically engineer an animal that actually enjoyed suffering? And I want to repeat, I'm not actually, uh, emphasize rather. I want to actually emphasize that I'm not suggesting S and M pig that we produce S and M pig. Right. But what I am, I, I, I think your analogy is uh, is a good one. This is a thought experiment. You know, would there be anything right. wrong with that? And I actually I actually raised that question at that conference. I you know I raised my hand and said, what if we could breed a what if we could breed a pig that enjoyed life in a horrible factory farm and enjoyed suffering? Would would there be anything wrong with that? And there was this universal sense that there was something wrong with that. Um, that Could people articulate what it was exactly? Well, not really. One person compared it. I thought uh, Gary McCracken, a researcher at the University of Tennessee, compared it. He said, he said oh, yeah, that's Al Cap's schmoo. And Al Cap was the guy that did the comic script, Little, Little, Little Abner. And he had this sort of hypothetical mm-hmm. creature, this sort of this blue character that sort of looked like a smurf. And uh, which would which would love to do anything that humans wanted it to do, no matter how no matter how despicable or how painful, it just wanted to please and just and just loved to please. But again, I think I think nobody could really articulate what was wrong with that. But there was this sense of repulsion that that that's not something we should we should we should do. 
Yeah, I, I hadn't thought much about that scenario, but I spent a lot of time thinking about why I was uncomfortable with the idea of engineering farm animals that don't feel any pain. And it was really hard to put my finger on it. I mean, I think one of the things I came up with, though this isn't a completely satisfying answer, is that I worry that in some ways it would give us more license to mistreat animals. And would it give us an excuse to treat them poorly or allow us to continue treating them poorly? Um, and I think that is part of what makes it an uncomfortable idea, but it's hard to unpack what all the the facets of it are. Well, um, that, that, that is, you know, to take right now the, 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 the problem of meat, um, where PETA actually, Peel for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, actually has a million dollar uh, prize for uh, the person that can come up with palatable artificial meat, meat which is produced in a, in a Petri dish. Meat that's produced right. without without an animal being involved, and they actually made now they researchers in Germany recently actually made a hamburger, um, and ate it that was made of tissue culture cells. Apparently, the hamburger didn't taste very good, and apparently, it's really hard to right. make artificial meat. And and I you know when I was reading when I was reading your book, your section on that, you know, I I began to think about well, what if we could raise an animal that wasn't sentient? What if we could, what, but not raise, but what if we could, could, could breed an animal that didn't have any uh, pain receptors? What if we could breed an animal that was basically unconscious? It seems to me that in, at least logically, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what would be, I'm not sure what would be wrong with that. Um, that's what, that's what I think is so tricky about, a lot of these things is that you think through the logic and it's really hard to find a flaw. And yet there's still this, I guess, going back to the yuck factor, there's still this pit in your stomach sometimes that says, yeah, but I don't know. It just seems wrong. Yeah. Um, and so it's hard to sometimes reconcile the logic and the emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you um, a question about, um, about your research. How long were you working on, working on, working on your book? Well, it was about three years from start to finish, though it wasn't full time that whole time. I was working on some other projects at periods along the way, but about three years start to finish. Well, during during those three years, you interviewed a lot of people and you read a lot and you discovered. I mean, I learned a tremendous amount reading your book. I was just absolutely shocked by some Good. of the things um, that, that are going on that I had no idea of. What were the, what were the, the biggest surprises for you? What were the one or two things that just knocked you out that you had no idea was people were doing with animals or two animals? Well, one of the surprises I think uh, involved cloning. And I mean, I, I remember when Dolly was born or when she was announced in 1996 and there were all these headlines and every once in a while, someone clones, a scientist clones some new species and it makes headlines but I thought that was basically the extent of it. I had no idea how much cloning was going on sort of on a more everyday basis. And, you know, I don't want to mislead. It's not a mainstream reproductive technology. But I was surprised when I found out that there are several hundred cloned cows being born in the U.S. every year. And it's sort of totally off the radar. It's, I mean, it's not a secret, but it doesn't make headlines. And it's not something that I knew about or that most people know about. So... And, and along those lines, I think I was surprised how quickly some of these technologies are becoming available to the public. I was shocked that I could go to Berkeley and see this state-of-the-art lab making a remote-controlled beetle and then go on the Internet and buy sort of a simpler version of that for $99. Yeah. And some of the other technologies, too, are, are trickling out to the public pretty fast. And so... It's surprising to me a little bit how accessible some of these these tools are becoming. One of the um, the 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 things that that um, got me thinking as I was reading your book is you know we were just talking about you know would it be ethical to breed an animal that um, you know doesn't have certain capacities the capacity to, to feel pain or the capacity uh, uh, you know you know to, to be conscious. 
But you also talk about the other, the other side of that, which is what happens, you know, can, you know, could we make animals that are, that are, that are, that are smarter? So for example, this isn't exactly smarter, but the idea of which has been done, where you insert, insert a gene that's associated with language in humans, you insert that gene into a mouse. Mm-hmm. So you have you have you know you know mice with a gene that has the, the human language gene in it. Now I remember when they did that study, and the mouse did not speak English, as I recall it, lo- no, it lowered it its not. voice a little bit, but it didn't speak English. But 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 could you talk a little bit about work that's sort of going on in that area about about you know making animals smarter, inclusion of, of human human cells, human neurons into into animals. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a fair amount of research going on to put either human genes that affect the brain into animals, so th- genes that affect language in the study you're talking about, or genes that affect brain cells. You can put human versions of these genes into animals, or you can put human cells directly into animals or animal brains. You can transplant certain cells into the brains of mice when they're you know, just born and some of these human cells will grow up to be human brain cells in the mouse's brain. And so these kinds of experiments have have raised a lot of ethical concerns. On on the one hand, there are a lot of ethicists and uh, legislators and um, other experts who are really worried about these advances. And, you know, you get concerns. Some of them are a little fantastical, but of, you know, a a human mouse hybrid that can speak English and has a human-like brain, which we're not really close to yet or anytime soon. But there are some legitimate concerns about, you know, when you get into primates and you start making some of these changes, could it give rise to something like human-like consciousness or sentience or human-like, you know, cognition? And that can be worrying because, you know, there are concerns about how do you treat such an animal if it were stranded in between species? Uh, what sort of rights should it have? Um, would it actually be happier if it were, quote unquote, smarter? Or would it be more miserable? On the other side of the coin, there are some futurists and transhumanists who say, we are obligated to do this to animals, not for our sake, but for their sake, that we have a duty to, quote unquote, you know, raise them up to enhance their cognition, to make them smarter, and that it's sort of a form of, um, it, it's an injustice to withhold these technologies from other species and that we should be improving their brains and their minds. So that's the other side of the argument. And, you know, the, the research is in pretty early stages, so we're not close to either of these far out scenarios, but they're questions that ethicists are already beginning to re- wrestle with. This this raises the question of uh, what's the difference between, you know, what's the difference between people and, and non, you know, human and non-human animals? And this has come up with this idea. Some, sometimes you heard the, hear the term tossed around personhood. Um, right. Yep. And so, for example, uh, Peter Singer, the, uh, the animal rights philosopher, uh, you know, the, the guy that really, you know, whose book really jump-started the modern animal rights movement, very, very, right. a, a brilliant philosopher, um, has really put a lot of effort into the Great Apes Project, which is to try and get legal status for great apes on the grounds that they're, they're, they're persons. Um, right. what, what's, your, what's your take on that, on that argument? Um, I mean... I hope it's not a cop out to say that I'm conflicted. Um, I mean, it's not entirely clear to me what the designation of a non-human person means or what rights accompany that. I mean, it's something that I think people are still working out. Um, I certainly would support, you know, any efforts we can make to reduce the use of primates and particularly you know, some of these primates that are very close to humans in, in medical research and invasive research uh, to improve conditions for them, to have fewer of them in captivity. I support all of that. I'm reluctant to 
do things like create an outright ban on research on chimps because there are times when that can be incredibly useful and important. Um, so I guess I'd want to see a, a striking of that balance. Um, but it's certainly been interesting to, to watch that movement emerge. And it's not just chimps. There's, you know, an argument that the dolphins should get designated as non-human persons. And it is interesting to come sort of circle back to an issue in your book, how we treat different species differently. And, you know, it's not all species that these projects are dedicating themselves to securing more rights for. It's, you know, a small subset of species that we humans have de deemed important or complex or often, you know, similar to us. So in some ways it might be sort of even enhancing those inconsistencies in the ways we view different species. Right. One of the interesting things to me is that uh, is the moral status of uh, dogs. And this is uh, this was yeah. brought up recently in a uh, an op ed in the New York Times by a scientist, a very good scientist from Emory, uh, Greg Greg Burns, who uh, did an incredibly difficult task. He trained his own dog, and now is training a bunch of dogs uh, to sit still in the MRI machine. And uh, while you do a functional MRI to look at what's going on in, in their brain and what uh, he wrote, he wrote a paper uh, uh, published in a very good journal uh, in which he showed that the same part of the dog's, his dog's brain lit up uh, as lights up in the human brain when the animal is given a, given a reward. And uh, right. he's recently written a book about this research. And, but he had a, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times and the headline of the op-ed was uh, dogs are people too, and yeah, I, I, I was, I was, I didn't know what to make of that. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, number one, I'm not sure that 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 research showed that dogs are people, and it seems to me that that the implications of that of of thinking of dogs as people. Uh, are, are, are profound. I mean, if they're people, we don't have the right to own them. We don't have the right to own people. Um, and this gets to the issue of, you know, what, what are the rights of, what are the rights that are, that are, uh, that, that come along with being, with being a person. And, and th th this bleeds into other debates in our culture as well. For example, it bleeds into the abortion debate. A lot of animal rights activists don't like to think about this. But the fact is that uh, anti-abortionists use uh, the personhood argument, and they argue that uh, you know a fetus is a person, and therefore has a right has a right to life. Um, so this this issue is is a is a big one, and it gets really muddy. And it's one thing to say that well we should grant personhood to animals, but um, the, the implications to that are that our relationships with them will be very very different than they are in it right now. And I mean, the other sort of part of the idea, that idea that I question is, well, are animals only valuable if we find that they're similar to mm -hmm. us as humans? Like, you know, can we, do they not have their own value as whatever species they are? And I think sometimes there's this tendency to say, well, species that are very human-like in their behavior, or their cognition, like those are really special. Right. Um, I totally agree. I thought I, one of the things that I that I didn't like about the headline of the of the Times piece, uh, you know, dogs are people too. I thought it was demeaning to dogs. <laughs> I, thought, yeah. I, thought, I thought dogs don't want to be people. We need to recognize dogs for what they are, which is which is dogs. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a there's, there's a there's a wonderfulness to dogs that, uh, that, that that occurs because they're dogs, not be, not because they're people. Bob Dylan has a great quote one time on his radio show where he said, uh, "If a dog could talk, you wouldn't want one for a pet." <laughs> I think he might be yeah. right. <laughs> it's true. Well, I think we're sort of running up against our our time here. Is there? We've been a little bit all over the map. Is there anything else you want to add or or throw in before we? We conclude. Yeah, let me throw in one thing. It's something I've been thinking about lately. Is uh, you know I've been studying this stuff now for gosh close to thirty years, and I think there's something happening in our culture now that I that I haven't seen before, and I've been sort of reluctant to recognize. And I think now 
that we really are on the verge of a sea change when it comes to how people are thinking about animals. And um, I don't know how it's going to play out. I think there's been so much publicity about things like, uh, 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 you know, with, with the movie Blackfish, with the recent incident right. in yeah. the Netherlands with the uh, with the zoo killing the you know killing the the, the, the giraffe. Um, mm -hmm. There's just every time I open the paper, I, I see an I see an animal issue, and I I think that. It'll be interesting to see if uh, if animal rights takes the path that something like gay marriage has taken. You know, where where this was something that would have been, you know, unthinkable fifteen or twenty years ago, and it's now accepted by the majority of people. And and I I think it's possible that we're on the verge, finally, of a of a serious rethinking on a large scale of our relationships with other species and how we should treat them. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think that's maybe a, a great place to end this conversation, though. I know we could probably go on for hours. So um, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. It's It's been really interesting and, and enlightening. Well, I've really, I really enjoyed it, too. And uh, let me, by the way, put in a plug for uh, the blog that I write for Psychology Today. It's called The, oh, it's called the Animals and Us. And, um, you know, I write fairly regularly, and it, and it it raises a lot of these sorts of issues that we've been that we've been been talking about. So thanks for inviting me uh, to to join you in this conversation. Sure, and uh, to all the uh, viewers, I've I've read the blog and it's great. If you're interested in the things we've been talking about, it's a, a great way to keep up on some of these issues um, as well. So thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed it. So should we count down to stop? I guess. Yeah, except. Uh, yeah, let's do that. Go ahead. Uh, three, two, one, 